Hi there, I am Alex Alexander and this is your first PowerPoint for Clinical Laboratory Diagnosis Lecture, which is part of your Naturopathic Clinical Diagnosis New Systems course. And this particular PowerPoint is Week 2, Clinical Laboratory Tests, Which, Why, and What Do the Results Mean? And so as it is an introduction to the practical usage of laboratory medicine, let me just tell you that the entire slideshow that you're watching and listening to right now came from the article entitled Clinical Laboratory Tests, Which, Why, and What Do the Results Mean? that I've placed in your optional folder. Um, so if you are either bored or really super um, excited about this, go read the entire article because it's awesome. I won't be covering the sensitivity specificity issues um, that I believe you're, you're going to be getting the first week based on um, what I've seen in your folder already in the syllabus. So I'm not going to cover that. The article does cover that. Uh, first disclaimer, maybe the only disclaimer, is that I um, and there may be some noise in the background as I am watching my two young children today at home. So if there's any noise, I can't I can't pause this. It's a keynote, not PowerPoint. So I'm just going to keep moving on because I've currently, or this is, I think, take number 12, and I really don't want to be recording this the rest of my life. So if you hear some little small children, then just pretend like you don't. All right. So how much do I need to know? Well, the abstract that I've posted here on the next slide is according to recent published literature training in many medical schools, the medical specialty, and we're talking about laboratory medicine that nearly every practicing physician relies on daily is limited to no more than a few scattered lectures throughout the entire curriculum. And so you guys are going to get way more than that, and that's pretty exciting. And um, this article is kind of depressing from that perspective because, in fact, lab medicine is heavily relied on, and we'll get into the percentages of that uh, a little bit later on. And yet, um, doctors, all doctors, just get not very much training in working with laboratory medicine. So I'm hoping that's not true for you. So diagnostic decision-making on the next slide there. The current list of tests offered by even one major reference laboratory that the article looked at included nearly 3,000 analytes. So that doesn't even include the additional array of tests commonly ordered, like this complete blood count, electrolytes, thyroid stimulating hormone, glucose, etc. So that's a whole big bunch of tests, and um, I'll, I'll be testing you on, on all 3,000 of those um, at the end of this week. So um, actually, no, no, that's not even true at all. All right, so medical decision making. The recent, recent emphasis on reducing health care costs and the emergence of managed care organization has led to efforts to reduce the abuse and misuse. And those are defined, reducing the abuse is over-ordering, and the misuse is ordering the right test for the wrong purpose or vice versa of these tests. And, you know, I had a little, eh, I kind of had a little reaction to reading that. I'm going to read that to you again, see if you have a reaction to it. So the recent emphasis on reducing health care costs and the emergence of managed care organizations led to the efforts to reduce the abuse over ordering. And that's where I kind of got hung up because I don't necessarily feel that it's malicious. So that term abuse kind of bothered me a little bit. But I can see where second and third party payers would certainly feel that it was abusive to them. And the truth is the macro health care dollar is limited and we are the gatekeepers. So it's really important that we use recently published guidelines, standards of care, best practices all the way through our medical practice. And right here in laboratory medicine is a big one where we actually need to target what we're ordering. So let's move on to medical necessity. And I'm going to ask you to consider the importance, the importance of selecting and ordering the most rational laboratory tests on a specific patient is heightened in the current age of managed care. And this whole medical necessity and outcome-oriented medicine has a lot to do with it. So the days of the shotgun approach to ordering lab tests, um, those, are just, those are just gone. They've been replaced by the rifle approach based on understanding of the test diagnostic performance and the major legitimate reasons that you'd want to order that lab test. Uh, such an understanding is critical to good lab practice and patient outcomes. Next slide, medical necessity. As second and third party payers seek to provide quality medicine cost effectively, and let's focus, keep your eyes on the money there, reduction in the ordering of unnecessary lab tests has become a favorite target of these efforts. And, you know, I, I'm a little tongue in cheek on, on that, keep your eyes on the money, but it, it really is a big deal. You know, and it isn't just big business wanting to penalize you um, as a, 
as a doctor, penalize your patient in order to save money. And I, I choose to not think that's true. I choose instead to believe what I said earlier in that there, there really is not an infinite amount of resources. And so since there is a finite amount of resources, it is up to us. And that's why we have the degrees that we get when we graduate from this program that you're in now in, in order to be that gatekeeper in order to be that person who is going to provide good medicine at a reasonable cost so that everyone, there's something for everyone and the lion's share not going to uh, just a few people. So I hope that made sense. So medical necessity again, the next slide, the critical question facing docs becomes what constitutes an unnecessary lab test. And in the current climate of business-oriented medicine, the answer shouldn't be, now keep your, keep your ears open there, the answer should not be and what was the question? What constitutes an unnecessary lab test? Any test for which reimbursement by a payer is likely to be denied. So you shouldn't not, whoa, here we go, you should not not order a test just because Medicare is not going to cover it, just because Regions isn't going to pay for it. You don't withhold that test from your patient. The correct answer, in fact, is any test for which the results are not likely to be medically necessary. That is what constitutes an unnecessary lab test. So, and that's defined in the appropriate management of the patient's medical condition. So, you know, if you're just ordering a test because you're curious, yeah, curiosity alone, in the absence of clinical signs and symptoms, history, physical exam, does not constitute a necessary lab test. So that would fall in the unnecessary laboratory test category. So next slide, what in the world are you trying to say? Well, let's look at an example. Here's a denial of coverage. And this is a denial of coverage just pulled straight out of one of my reviews. Um, I am that person in my real job. I review other doctors and mental health providers and determine if they follow standards of care. Did they actually do what they're supposed to do? And supposed to do is defined by What's out there in the guidelines? What does the current published literature tell us we should be ordering? And that this doctor, is this Dr. John Wayne? Did he just go out there and decide to, you know, um, you guys are probably a lot younger than me. I'm just going to take a guess that you probably maybe have heard of John Wayne. Has this guy gone rogue? Is this somebody that's just decided, um, has he just decided to, um, you know, just order whatever test he wants to because he has a hunch and he's playing house? you know, or whatever, that, that's really not going to get paid for. So unless you can justify why you're ordering the test, then you probably shouldn't order it. But conversely, like I said on the previous slide, if your hunch is strong enough and your belief and you can back it up and you know it's not going to get paid, then the, you know, you have that um, charge to order it anyway. You know, you can't let yourself not order a test just because you know it's not going to get paid for. I think I've beat that horse to death now. So denial of coverage. Let's read the sentence here. In light of the aforementioned reasons, I think the in light of aforementioned reasons, I do not recommend reimbursement for treatment rendered on 625.12, billed as 99213, which I put in there for you was an E&M code, and E&M stands for Evaluation and Management, and 85025, which is a CBC, Complete Blood Count with Differential, as I do not find this treatment medically reasonable or necessary related to, and there's the keywords in this one, to twelve twelve motor vehicle accident based on current published guidelines. If additional information becomes available, the doctor may submit it for reconsideration, and there are criteria supporting why this doctor's not getting paid, and this is an actual naturopathic um, doctor. This isn't a made-up case. Um, this is just the, the very last sentence in the denial letter, where in this case the doctor ordered a CBC with differential for um, the sequelae of a four-month-old motor vehicle accident, but the notes and the clinical decision-making did not substantiate the blood test, and therefore the insurance company's not paying for it, and the patient's going to end up paying for that. Was it medically necessary? I don't know. I, I I don't know what the doctor was thinking because he or she did not put it in the in the notes for me to be able to evaluate. And similarly, your um, your regular insurance companies this happened to be a PIP claim, but you know your Regents, your Premier, your Blue Cross Blue Shield, all those they are not going to pay for tests that you can't substantiate. All right, questions to ask before ordering a test: Why is the test being ordered? What are the consequences of not ordering the test? I like this one a lot. This one helps me because I'm all about what's going to kill my patient because I'm disinterested in killing my patients. 
How good is the test in discriminating between health versus disease? How are the test results interpreted? And how will the test influence patient management and outcome? That's a beautiful list. And I wish I'd had this list when I was a student, but I didn't. You do. So I would like, you know, if you carry a clipboard around, this might be attached to it. You know, I might just uh, take some packing tape and, um, and, you know, a piece of paper and tape this right on my clipboard before I start ordering tests. So why ask these questions? Because the answers to these questions are critical to the optimal selection and cost-effective use of lab medicine. Um, laboratory tests likely to benefit the patient's management. So which is better, physical or clinical diagnosis? Next slide there. Is it better to just, and when I say clinical diagnosis, I mean laboratory diagnosis. So is it better to just order every lab test I can justify or... Is the physical exam better? Well, it's a major misconception out there among cl clinicians is that a lab test is going to be more objective than a patient's history and physical exam. So in class, we're going to talk about what your thoughts are. And we're not just going to talk about what your thoughts are because I have thoughts too. And sometimes they just aren't relevant. And sometimes I can't prove them. So we're going to ask you to prove it. Why you think one is better than the other. So physical versus laboratory diagnosis, if we're looking at which is better on the next slide there, what does the published literature tell us? Well, the published literature says history is greater at identifying the diagnosis than is physical exam or laboratory medicine, but that physical exam is greater or equal to laboratory medicine depending on what you're trying to diagnose. So always, always, always history is going to be better. Always, always, always. But physical exam and lab, laboratory testing, lab tests, could be a dead heat. Or PE could be better. Or lab could be better. It could just, it could be either one. But it really depends on what you're trying to diagnose. And, and what, what I'll use as a model, since we're in HEENT, is to compare and contrast the diagnosis of strep throat with viral pharyngitis. And hopefully, by the time you have are listening and watching this, you've already checked out Dr. Acosta Smith's PowerPoint, so you kind of know what the strep throat versus viral pharyngitis rodeo looks like. So for discussion questions, next slide there, use your favorite journal resource to find an article that compares history to physical exam to lab diagnosis, and bring that into class. I mean, you don't have to print it, but just, you know, kind of mark it on your whatever device, electronic device you're using, and we'll talk about it. And what are the exceptions? How does this make your job easier and your patients safer? And what role does or should the insurance reimbursement play in this? You know, how much, should, how much stock should you put in that in terms of which test you're using to arrive at a diagnosis? I hope at this point in the lecture, in the PowerPoint, that you have more questions than answers. And I'm going to encourage you to jot those down so that we can discuss them all. Four major reasons, next slide, to order a lab test. Hmm. Diagnosis, to rule in or rule out. Monitoring, the effect of drugs, the effect of your therapy. Screening, and the example is given of congenital hypothyroidism via a neonatal thyroxine test. And then lastly, research to understand the pathophysiology of a particular disease process. So research, all bets are off on um, the second and third party payers. From vein to brain, the principal approaches for establishing a diagnosis based on laboratory results include, and this is a really nice list, hypothesis deduction, pattern recognition, medical algorithms, and then again that rifle versus shotgun approach. So this, is, this list here is the principal approach for establishing a diagnosis based on a laboratory test result. And if we're looking at that hypothesis deduction model, hypothesis deduction involves establishing a differential diagnosis based on everything. Patient's history, including family, social, and drug, physical exam findings, followed by the selection of a lab test that's most likely to confirm a diagnosis on the list of differential diagnoses. Sounds real simple, but it's not all that simple until it is. I mean, you know, they call it practice for a reason. So just when you get it all figured out, they'll change the ICD-9s to ICD-10s and the DSM-4s will become DSM-5s. And uh, Okay, 
Example of the hypothesis deduction approach, a four-year-old child presents to the clinic with an upper respiratory tract infection, abbreviated URI. Fever of 102.2 and what the parents think are seizures last in about two minutes. Well, you observe a seizure conveniently while the child is in your office. You establish a differential diagnosis of meningitis versus febrile seizures, and you deduce, because you're awesome, by the way, and you deduce that the most appropriate lab tests to discriminate between these possibilities are performed on the cerebrospinal fluid. So you're not going to mess with sending them over there to get their blood drawn uh, down the hall at the Bastyr Clinic. You're going to refer the patient for an urgent spinal tap, most likely to a local emergency department, and you're going to call ahead and alert the doctor there, the attending, uh, what's showing up in his or her ER, or ED as it's now called. All results for these tests were either normal or negative, as it turns out, no growth cultures, supporting a diagnosis of febrile seizures over bacterial, viral, or fungal meningitis. And you breathe a sigh of relief. Phew, I'm so glad. I mean, I called that doctor and told him I thought it was meningitis, or I was worried that it was meningitis, so the last point there, did you waste the patients or the insurance company's resources and why or why not? How are you feeling about that about now? So the question on the next slide is it wasn't meningitis, so did I overreact? And these are these questions and these comments are all based, fortunately the information came out of the article, but this is based on real world experiences. I can't tell you how many times a younger, and not just younger because I'm older than dirt, but newer in practice, newer in medicine, doctors say, did I overreact? Should I have not ordered that? And I say to them, oh no, you absolutely had no choice but to order that. Ask yourself what's going to kill your patient. Get you sued and generally be decided by a peer review to be bad medical practice and go from there. And you'll think you're never reacting, overreacting. So if you come from a place of best practices and you think of what's the worst possible outcome and address that, because the clinical signs, not just because you're, in fe you're scared to death, because I've scared you to death, but because the clinical signs and symptoms are present to substantiate your differential diagnosis and your evaluation and your medical decision making, drive on, my friend, because you will never be wrong. But you will be wrong if you choose to ignore obvious signs and symptoms. Don't get the tests and the patient did have meningitis. Whoa. I will tell you case after case after case on our discussion in class throughout the next term that we have together of real world examples, including my own. And the reason I tell people, students, I've been teaching a while now, the reason I tell students all the mistakes I've made is because you are also going to make mistakes. And fortunately, Doctors who make mistakes, admit them, use them as training tools, and move forward tend to be better doctors. Those are the patients, those are the doctors that the patients don't sue. And lots of re research on, on this. You're the ones that don't get into any sort of litigation because you are coming from a place of pure honesty and using the best clinical decision-making process that you have with the guidelines that are available to you. And I feel strongly that if you do that, like me, you'll never do anything that's particularly egregious. You know, fortunately, I've never killed anybody with a bad decision. But, you know, but for the grace of the universe, right? Because any of us could make a mistake. So the more training that we get and the more ability that we have to recognize when we're about to go over the cliff, the better we're going to be at taking good care of our patients. And knowing a little tiny bit about Bastyr and a whole lot about Dr. Lori Cullen, I am betting that you guys are well positioned to be awesome. All right, pattern recognition. Pattern recognition, recognition involves comparing the patient's pattern of results for several laboratory tests or clinical findings that have been determined previously to provide excellent power in discriminating between the various competing and or closely related diagnoses. That makes my head hurt. So what am I saying here? What's pattern recognition really? Well, let's look at the next slide and we'll see examples of pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is just what it sounds like. And let's use the croup epiglottitis model. Here is a pattern recognition 
we recognize that the findings in croup are this, and the findings in bacterial tracheitis are that, and peritonsillar abscess are that. Okay, so we're looking at a pattern that establishes a diagnosis. And if you look at the pink slide there, comparison of the features of epiglottitis and croup, that's a really nice one. There's lots of examples of pattern recognition out there. The most commonly used ones are involving the liver and um, autoimmunity, like antinuclear antibodies, which is one of my very favorite subjects. So I'm super stoked to talk to you about ANAs when we get there. Medical algorithms, thats our that was our third bullet point from the previous slide that gave us a list of four points. We're on number three now with medical algorithms. And medical algorithms or decision trees are particularly useful in establishing a diagnosis based in part on information obtained from ordering the most appropriate, i.e. necessary, laboratory tests. And there's entire websites devoted to me medical algorithms. There's books out there on medical algorithms. They are everywhere in medicine. Algorithms are logical and sequential. Um, they can be automated using a computer to achieve rapid turnaround time. They maximize your efficiency. They minimize ordering unnecessary lab tests. They can be used by ancillary medical personnel. I love that. The lowly physician's assistant, that's who they're referring to. They're probably actually referring to us too, but we're not going to take that on. That is, that's true for them. That's not true for me. Can be ancillary medical personnel. The, 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 um, the lab, the, the person who draws the blood might, you know, look at an algorithm and say, I noticed that the patient has turned um, blue, so perhaps that there's an algorithm for that. I, I don't know, I'm just grasping at straws to try to come up with a, who the ancillary medical personnel are, but anyway, they're, they're actually referring to, to PAs and ARMPs and what we think of as mid-level practitioners can be easily updated with improved strategies for diagnostic decision making as new and better tests become available and they're incorporated into software programs that are relatively inexpensive to purchase. I'm sure most of you have seen algorithms but I've given you an example of croup on the next slide. So clinical assessment of croup severity. There's a really super nice algorithm and I'm not going to read it to you because you have it right there in front of you. And then the last point is rifle versus shotgun. And I'm, I say the last point from the slide that we are now working on, points one through four. And the rifle versus shotgun approach to lab test ordering relates to ordering a specific targeted lab test based on an assessment of their diagnostic accuracy and predictive value. And we use that to identify a particular disease versus this indiscriminate ordering of just everything I can think of that may or may not have adequate diagnostic accuracy and predictive value in identification of a particular disease. So I can't go and order some test that's used to monitor cancer as a test to diagnose cancer. And when we get into those lab tests, you, like me as a student, will probably ask yourself, why not? And we'll talk about why not when we get there. And in using our previous example, ordering the following 20 lab tests, <laughs> excuse me, on the four-year-old child with signs and symptoms of the upper respiratory tract infection. This is the kid from the previous slide that had the 102.2, <coughs> excuse me, and generalized seizure lasting two minutes. That represents um, a shotgun and very expensive approach to arriving at a diagnosis if we were to use all the tests that I've listed here. So this would be the 20 lab tests that a doctor might order if this patient came in. And this is straight from the um, article. So, you know, it's funny where these articles come, or these uh, examples come from. Uh, almost always are real, because, you know, the truth is better than fiction. You can almost always um, bet that someone ordered all 20 of these when that child presented in their office. And, you know, I, I say err on the side of caution if you're terrified that you're going to harm somebody. You know, there's no... The, the patient may be mad at you because they have a great big bill, but if they're still alive, then they can just be mad at you. But we'd prefer to train you to deal with lab medicine as more of um, a, a more focused approach rather than the scatter approach. All right. So the next slide there, the algorithmic example of pediatric seizures. That thing is so small I can't even read it. And then next we have our more targeted approach. So a rifle approach would involve ordering only those lab tests used and discriminate between the disease, diseases that um, constitute the differential diagnosis. So you've come up with meningitis and febrile seizure. There's the list of blood tests that you would order for 
a differential diagnosis of meningitis and febrile seizure. And if we go back two slides, then we can see that's quite a difference. So we've got 20 lab tests there, and then we've got our small number of lab tests on the more targeted approach. Remember the math from Dr. Pellegrini. And then in closing thoughts, hold on guys, I'll be right there. In closing thoughts, the laboratory test results may influence up to 70% of medical decision making. So are the tests being interpreted correctly? And if not, what's the impact of this incorrect and appropriate um, interpretation on the accuracy of the diagnostic decision making? And then a 2008 survey of junior physicians in the UK, only 18% of them were confident about requesting 12 common chemistry tests, while more than half considered themselves usually confident or not confident in interpreting the results. So an interesting thought there. And then the lack of confidence in interpreting lab tests may be directly related to the sparse training in lab medicine provided in most United States medical schools. And our last slide, um, or I suppose it's the next to the last slide, treat the patient, not the lab result. Your x-ray showed you have a broken rib, but we fixed it with Photoshop. So please write your questions down for 